Only question I had is, is your show rated like PG? Just trying to understand just how... Oh, no. You know, okay. No, I curse all the time. Okay, good. <laughs> so, yeah, you drop drop whatever bom- F-bombs, curse, I don't care. All right, I always it. tell I always tell my guest, uh, I'll, I'll wait until you curse before I start cursing. Yeah, it probably won't take long. We're a good company. <laughs> <laughs> I curse at my job, so it's not like they don't know. It's funny, we can talk, I curse in interviews just so they know what they're getting into before they hire me. You got to test the waters. That's exactly what we do. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. Y'all ready? Ready. Let's do it. <clears throat> What's up, UX fam? How's your mom and them? Welcome to another episode of Beyond UX Design. I'm Jeremy. If you're new here, welcome to the show. I am super stoked to have you. And if you haven't done it already, please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you are regular here and you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would really appreciate you leaving a five-star review. That would be amazing. This week's audiobook recommendation is Louder Than Words, Harness the Power of Your Authentic Voice by Todd Henry. Louder Than Words is a guide that encourages individuals to find and express their unique voice in their work and in their life. The book emphasizes the importance of authenticity and how it can be a powerful tool in establishing a strong personal brand. Through a series of actionable strategies and real-world examples, Henry illustrates how one can hone their authentic voice to resonate with their audience and make a lasting impact. And this book can be a valuable resource for any UX designer out there looking to infuse more originality and authenticity into how they communicate with their teams. So head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash audibletrial to start your free trial and download Louder Than Words completely free and help support the show in the process. And as always, thanks so much to Chris, Siraquan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin for all their support. And if you want to join those fine folks and help keep the show independent and ad-free, you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month. That is less than a dollar an episode. And if you do that, you will get some sweet, sweet perks for your support. And of course, if you think the show is worth sharing, then for the love of God, tell some friends. So I've got today an interesting group. I've got uh, actually four, well, four including me. <laughs> I'm not good at math, y'all. That's why I became a designer. Uh, I've got three people from the UX Plus One podcast. I've got Corey Nelson, Antonio Ruberto, Crystal Ayub. They're going to join me today, and we're just going to talk about stuff. I don't even know what we're going to talk about. Crystal is a lead UX researcher for the Canadian Immigration Office. That's really interesting. I want to learn more about that. Antonio is a UX designer for a data management and compliance company. Corey is a UX lead and manager. And Corey, if you haven't followed him on LinkedIn, he's outspoken in the UX community on LinkedIn, which is how these three met and actually four, because that's how I met you too. Uh, They get together to fight the forces of evil and help UX job seekers by giving them actionable feedback on their resumes and portfolios. Thus, the UX Plus One podcast was born and I've got them on that show today. I am so excited. Corey, Antonio, Crystal, welcome to Beyond UX Design. I am super stoked to have you guys. How's it going? Hello. Hey, hey, good to be here. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having us. All right, so I've got the UX Plus One podcast here. I want you guys, can y'all go ahead and introduce yourselves so everybody knows who who's talking as we kind of have this conversation. Why don't you kick it off, Crystal? Hello, bonjour. My name is Crystal Ayub. I am a UX uh, lead researcher and I work for Immigration Canada. I think I'm the only one who is located in Canada here on this podcast. Yeah, we're, we're still technically not clear where Crystal's from. She keeps saying <laughs> Canada. That sounds like a Texas I, accent. No. We've been giving a crap about I'm it the Canadian. whole time. I'm <laughs> Canadian. Well, I'm Lebanese, but I live in Canada. You, you sound Texan. I was confused. I, you had oh that thing of Texas <laughs> accent. Do not keep chewing their gum. <laughs> it's way too long. I'm going to cut it at one point. It never loses taste or gum. <laughs> I know. It's awesome. All right, Antonio, how about you, man? Hey, everyone. My name is Antonio Roberto. I'm a uh, UX designer. I currently work for a company called uh, Innovative Systems based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, we do anti-money laundering, sanction screening, uh, compliance and data management software. That is fascinating. I could talk for yeah. hours just about that. Uh, that's <laughs> really cool. Trying to make the world a safer place. Uh, right on, man. I love <laughs> it. All right, Corey, what, what, what about you, man? Hey, folks. So this is Corey Nelson. Uh, I've been in the UX field for over 10 years now. I've been a professional designer for uh, going on 15. Uh, I currently work as a UX lead and manager for a marketing company, which is actually very new for me because I almost always work in SaaS and, uh, you know, enterprise corporations. This is the first time in a very long time that I've worked for a pure marketing company. I 
tend to get down a little bit on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, backed off a little bit recently, but I, I should be getting back into the groove uh, very soon here. Right on. Especially considering it's Wednesday. I'm supposed to be pissed today. <laughs> I'm pissed. <laughs> You're pissed. Everybody's pissed. I found out recently you are a fellow Louisiana native yes, too. Yes, sir. So, yeah, that is right. Yeah. You grew up right down the highway, right down I-10 from, uh, from me. You're at Laplace, nice. right? Is that where you? That's yeah, right. I'm, a little no name brand town. There you go. And uh, <laughs> I, I grew up in Metairie, right? Metairie, right down, right down the way. So that's where I went to school. Right. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I was spending a lot of time in Metairie. Right on. Actually, the hospital where I was born is in Metairie. Which one? As a matter of fact, uh, it was called uh, Lakeside. Lakeside, dude. Saying? That's where I was yeah. born. Yeah, <laughs> man, no way. Hell yeah. yeah, dude. Right on. That's crazy. Yeah, I actually grew up right behind Lakeside Hospital. So anyway. Okay. Right on. All right. So, I mean, <laughs> it was in a hospital. You didn't like, you weren't born like in the, in an alley behind the hospital. I was born right? in Lakeside. I lived behind Lakeside Hospital. Did you live behind? Yeah, okay. Right by right. the big library. Right there. All right. Well, cool. Awesome, guys. The fellow losing. That's, that's amazing, man. You're the first guest I've had on the show that has been born in the same hospital as me. How about that? <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. All right, guys. Well, welcome to the show. I'm super excited to talk to you guys today. So, Corey, one of the things that you, you post all the, but every week, I think on Wednesday, you're only pissed on Wednesday uh, about how you get, you know, you're, you're pissed about something. And I just, I love that series, by the way, man. I just want to give that shout out. Anybody out there who hasn't listened or hasn't found Corey on LinkedIn, uh, he's got some good stuff on, on there. So make sure you check that out. So, Corey, you had an interesting post a couple of weeks ago, and I want to kind of start the conversation off with that. Something I had never really considered before. You, you always hear people say, you know, be authentic, be yourself. <laughs> and you mm-hmm. suggested that uh, UX hiring is not unlike acting, right? When you go in and, and uh, you know, audition for, for a role, the actors aren't themselves, right? They're playing the character. And we should be somewhat right. similar to that. And I wanted right. to start the conversation off there because I find that concept so fascinating. Can you speak to that a little bit? I'm curious. And I'd love to get everybody's thoughts on that, if I may. Yeah. And you know, it's not just about UX hiring. I think it's, it's hiring in general in that when you are applying for a job, right, they need you for a very specific set of skills for a finite amount of time, assuming you're not going to work and do that for the rest of your life for 24 seven. Right. Uh, so you, You apply for this job and they want to see how you perform doing that specific role or being that specific person. And that's very much like being, you know, uh, an actor or performer or an artist of some kind. You go in and you do that. And then when the show is over, you're you're yourself again, right? So the whole concept of just going and be yourself, no one wants you, right? They want the abilities that you bring, right? They want the skills that you bring. They want the, the talent that you bring for the problems that they have, right? Other than that, they could care less about who you really are. And that's just being real about it. That's fascinating. So, so Crystal, Antonio, have you guys experienced something similar in, in your roles? Is that is that a sentiment you all share? I'm curious. I mean, I did work with actors. <laughs> they were one person at the interview and then another uh-huh. person on Monday, another person on Wednesday and, and so forth and so on. So I'm not sure. I feel like I'm for and against this, but... If you want to be, you know, prepared for your role, I mean, we all act every day. We're in meetings, we put on this hat and we say all these big fancy words. Just act every day. As long as you keep consistent about it and you're good with that. I don't want to have, you know, an actor on my team and then out of nowhere, he's not in that role anymore. Then something's Mm. wrong. Yeah. So I would say consistency is important. Whoever you pick to act at the interview, make <laughs> sure it's the same person when yeah. we're going to work together. <laughs> I was going to actually take this past the interview point and into the, the actual role of being a designer, because in my mind, you know, one of the core concepts and core responsibilities of a designer is to empathize with users. So you're always putting yourself in the user's shoe. So initially, my, my thought, my brain went instantly to, oh, yeah, we have to act as our users all the time and pretend we're doing their job or doing what they're doing or interacting with this application in the way that they would so that we can understand that character. And you have to kind of have to live and breathe that character in order to perform well, as in make good designs. And isn't that what method acting is? Yeah. Pretty much method acting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. It's, it's funny, you know, Crystal, you said you were on the fence about it. When I first read that post, I think I had like kind of, it almost like triggered me a little bit. I'll be honest. Like I, I had this sort of visceral reaction to it and I was like, what? No. I was like, no, no. You know? And then the more I thought about it, I was like, actually, this makes 
way more sense than what I think I had originally. Cause you know, I, I, I like to, I do, I like to give the advice, you know, be authentic, be yourself when you're in an interview, you know? And, but what is important though, is, and I think this is what Corey's speaking to is it doesn't matter how cool you are, how great you are, how nice of a person you are. What matters is that you can do the job at the end of the day. <laughs> and, you know, that's really, I think, I think what you're getting at more than anything else. And that was, you know, I, I guess like, um, I don't know. I like to, cause we mentioned this before, uh, you guys asked if, if we curse on the show and I said, I like to curse in interviews, you know? And so to me, that's sort of my authentic <laughs> self. And I would be, I would be acting if I was holding that back, you know? And, and the reason mm-hmm. just so anybody's listening is like, why would you curse an interview? Uh, I curse in an interview because I want them to know what they're getting. Because what well, the last yep. thing I want is them to hire me thinking I'm not like that. And in a meeting, I'm like, ah, fuck this, you know, or, ah, screw that. You know, what the hell? <laughs> and then have somebody be offended. You know, I want that to be yeah. something they know they're going to get. And Corey, I'm curious, like from that perspective, how do you approach that as far as the idea of like acting? You know, I think there's probably a balance there. There's someone's tolerance for showing too much and maybe not getting the job versus maybe lowering it a little bit, code switching perhaps to, to get that job. I'm curious what you think. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's kind of two parts of that, I think. Uh, the one, circling back to the interview for just a little bit, when you mentioned about, like, it doesn't matter how cool you are. Um, if you consider the times when I'm sure we've all had it, when you interview and you feel like you've knocked it out of the park, right? You've had the best conversation. The, you really connected with the folks. You answer all the questions and you just walk out of there and you're on cloud nine. He's like, I totally nailed that interview. <laughs> and then you still get rejected, right? Yeah, yeah. So what does that tell you? <laughs> Right. right. What, does, what does that tell you? That, that tells you that they probably felt you were a pretty great person, right? Outside of work, that's probably some friends that you're, that you're going to hang out with, you know, at, at, that would have been at some point. But they still didn't feel that you were the right person to do the role, right, to, to fill in that spot. So that's another, that just goes to show you that it, it really doesn't matter, quote unquote, authentically who you really are. If you can't solve their problems by filling that role, then they're not going to bring you on. And about kind of sharing too much, yeah, um, I mean, we've all had days where we shut down our computer and we're, we're done with work. Cause like, uh, I should have cursed that bastard out, right? <laughs> or I should have, but that's not who we always are, right? Uh, that's not who we, you know, that's not the person that we project all the time. So there's, there's work and then there's real life. And I think there's a, there should be a fair and a very solid separation between the two. I think there's degrees of authenticity that you can approach interviews with also depending on your skill level. I think it's mm. really hard as a junior, as a, someone trying to break into the UX industry or break into any job really, to be as authentic as you wanna be if you don't have any weight behind you. If you're like, I don't have any experience, I don't have any job skills, I, I, you know, this is, I'm trying to get my first position. It's like, you have to be super humble and aware of that, it, you know, not kind of kiss their ass in a way, you know, like it's just, <laughs> yeah, the, it's, yeah, yeah. it sucks, but it's kind of the way that it is. And then as you grow, as you become more senior, as you get a lot more weight behind your work, I, I think you can kind of walk in with a little bit more bravado and be like, this is, this is who I am. This is what you're getting. You don't like it. It's fine. I can get an offer somewhere else type thing. You know, one of the, one of the bits of advice that I tell people a lot and, and or used to tell people, and I, I, I think over the last maybe even recently, six months, I've started to kind of rethink this advice. But the advice is, you know, you know you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Right. And your job as a candidate is not only to impress them, it's also to figure out if this is actually a job that you want. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't want to just take any job. And to your point, Antonio, about the level that you're at, a new hire or someone with zero experience coming straight out of school has very little ability to make that decision for the hiring manager, right? I mean, I guess, is that the right way to say it? Like you, you have very low expectations or very low chance of being picky. In that sense, yeah. right, is better, a better way to put it. So, but the higher you get, you know, someone with a lot of experience, you can be yourself because you can back it up with the with the experience. And you know, when you're a junior designer coming out of school or junior anything, like we said, it's a lot harder to do that. And you, you know, so I've kind yeah. of been like taking that a step back and been like, maybe, maybe that's not best advice for someone yeah. straight out of a boot camp. You know, unless yeah. unless you have the experience, and maybe that's advice for more senior people. I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts. You just said, yeah, so I guess you agree. <laughs> well, it's the same way we treat, we, we, we tell people to treat their portfolios, right? Like when you're, mm-hmm. when you're getting out of a boot camp or university or career changing and you're going into your first UX job, you've built your first portfolio, that portfolio should be really tailored to um, what's going to best show your ability to do that first job. But when you get a lot more experience under your belt, 
you can be more creative. You can be a little bit more, you know, show this thing or show that thing in your portfolio because you've got 20 years and you've got this work to back it up. So I feel like it kind of works in the same way. Yeah. And we've given that advice a few times on the, on our podcast, right? Where we, we told folks as, um, you really don't want to have this here right now, considering how, how junior you are, right? In a couple of years, you can, you can go a little crazier. You can, you can be a little more loose with what you're sharing, what you're sharing about yourself and what you're sharing about your, your work. Like when you're new, you really want to get to the point, get people to understand what the, the role you played and the work you did and the problems you had, and then let them get on with their life. But as you grow in your career, then yeah, you can start to care a little less. You can be a little loose. You can take some liberties. You can curse in your interviews, right? And you can test those kind of waters. Uh, but that's, you're not going to have those kind of liberties when you're, when you're very new. I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence of everything today. <laughs> Maybe because it's Wednesday. Actually, it's yeah. Wednesday. So I'll call it, this is Pissed Wednesday. <laughs> so yeah. Corey yeah. is supposed Corey's to be writing a post today. So right. the way that I'm thinking about this is I currently work for the government. I have worked for the private before and it's very different. I mean, there's some instances where we hire people on the way they problem solve. That's what I would call personality and not so much if they have the skills or not. If they know how to think and they can solve a problem, that's pretty much what we do. So why not? You know, we can teach them the skills. It's not that hard. And then they can develop something that they've never touched on before. So that's how I'm thinking. And there's another point that I wanted to bring on. I don't know if it's, I don't know what it is. It's like, oh, you're a junior, I'm senior, I'm bigger than you. Like, just be yourself, like do whatever you want, but read the room. Obviously, everyone has different personalities. If you're applying for a company that's really strict, don't walk in there with ripped jeans and like, mm -hmm. yo, what's up? Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> you have yeah, to exactly. read the room you know and then that's how i would take on the conversation i don't think there's a set of rules to be honest just be it's common sense read the room people are different companies are different make it like do your research talk to the people that work there be prepared you know when you get into that environment that context i think it will give you some insights like don't walk in that room just being blind and be like oh, okay i'm just gonna do whatever that's how i'm thinking yeah. about it. yeah I would agree with that. Uh, I think that's a great point too. You know, every interview is different. Every interview style is different. I, I remember I had an interview once uh, years ago where I got completely berated by the CEO and she did nothing but just like insult me. And I was like, what oh, the wow. fuck? Good. And then an hour later, I had an <laughs> offer letter in my email inbox. They were like, we just wanted to see how you would take that. So wow. I'm like, what a, weird, oh, what a weird technique. But I was just like, you took it on the chin. You want to see how you handled the CEO. And I'm like, that's crazy okay that's bullshit right there yeah I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah it is bullshit you don't want to be working for that ceo like really hell. really oh yeah hold on i'm curious did you take that job i did yeah <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> what was it like was it it was was there ever scenarios that were like that in real life where they absolutely were, but it and, was yeah. it was it was interesting um because it wasn't in like an insult i don't know I, it's hard to describe it wasn't in like i'm trying to insult you it's almost like i'm going to challenge everything you say and see how you handle that Ah, okay. Um, okay. Because you're yeah, gonna have different. to be, yeah. you're gonna have to be challenged. Um, and then also, oh, there are things being said like, "I don't think you're right for this job." Tell me why you think you're right mm. for this job, like things like that. Oh, so okay. it was like challenging yeah. and and very aggressive sort of language. But you know, it it Tough was a good love. experience, I think, to have Tough because love, it yeah. gave you thick skin. <laughs> yeah. Crystal, would you see that in, in Canada? That kind of interview? That, <laughs> yeah. that, if I go to work at Chanel, They're so yes. polite there, I thought. But if I'm working for a <laughs> random company, hell no, I walk out. Sorry, uh, you didn't. Uh, you didn't give me consent that I was going to be put in that testing environment. <laughs> Let me know what you round go. this yeah. is. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of yeah. It's like a turn off. I don't know. But reading the room, that's a re that's a really great advice because uh, you know where I work. I work for GE you know, big giant corporation. And there's offices where people wear shorts and t-shirts to work. And there are offices where people wear coats, like suits uh, to yeah. work. Right. And you, if you don't, they'll send you home. And so it's like one of those things like you could go and do research. Like, how do I get a job at GE? What is an interview like? And you could have conflicting information all over the place, but until you get there, you know, how do you read the room? You know, what's interesting though is, is, and this is where I tell other advice. I tell people, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, but you know, going and doing that networking piece, it's not about just meeting people. It's about doing your due diligence and your research to prep for that next step to know, am I going to need to wear a suit? 
are they going to be cool with me wearing ripped jeans and a t-shirt? You know, yep. because that's kind of, you know, that, that's on you as the candidate to find that out before you, because the last thing you want to do is show up and then we're like, oh, I read the room, but I'm, you know, too late, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yes. I'm, I'm curious, is that, what kind of advice you guys have for, for uh, people in that scenario? I mean, I have a quick, easy solution. I don't know if it's the right one, but that's what I would do. No, let me hear I it. would get to the place really early and I would have a few outfits lined up. I would just scan mm. around and be like, what is everyone looking like? Okay, I'm going to wear this and then I'll be fine. How else would you know? That's even assuming people still do in-person interviews. Like yeah, so exactly. many interviews I've seen are all like this now. All right. So just, just have a good change of clothes off camera right next to you and just switch real quick. Yeah. <laughs> can you get up real quick? Speaking of like <laughs> actors, yeah. I was just thinking you have, because really you can only see from the from the waist up, right? Mm-hmm. You could just have like a couple of t-shirts, like a suit, just a coat, throw it on real quick. <laughs> Um, what's mm-hmm. funny, actually, I'm, I'm actually in my closet right now. Like you can see all like, I have like my clothes yeah. and stuff. I'm like, literally in my closet. So I got like, I got a whole wardrobe right here. I could just literally grab anything. I'm like, oh wait, oh, Audible, you know, <laughs> yeah. shit, I gotta, I need a coat. Get my coat on real quick. Yeah. Just another thing to remember, uh, outside of doing like, uh, spy game 007 stuff. <laughs> like, like Crystal is, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's not that dark. <laughs> you can, um, make use of your recruiter if you have one and just ask the simple question of, what should I wear? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that should, that should really get you going. That's the great advice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if it's that, if it's a question, just wear what you would wear at work. And if you don't fit in, maybe that's not meant for you. Like, why would you want to change to go to a company? Yeah. And, and this is where that, I think when I read Corey's post, it, it like kind of got me in the gut. I see what you mean. Cause I, I give that same advice, you know? And like what I, and, but, but I think what, what the, the main point of Corey's thing is there is a tolerance for that. On yeah. the on the candidate side, right? If if you desperately need the job, right, Corey? I think this is if I'm if I'm hearing what you're saying, right? If you really need the job, trying to be yourself might keep you from getting the job. Yes. <laughs> if right. you really need the job, if you don't really need the job, and you can be picky, then you can sort of test the waters and be yeah. more selective or self selecting, I guess, in a way. Right, yeah. Corey? Is that kind of right? Yeah, that that's good in there, and um, I, I think a lot something that a lot of people miss is getting a job is not the end of your career journey, right? right. That is oh, yeah. that is just one step of it. And when I ended that post, I'm like, there's going to be a point, there should be a point in your life when getting a job is not a priority for you. I mean, it's going to be what do you do with what you earn from that job, right? Because you want to get to the point where you can make your own rules and, and you don't have to give a shit about, you know, who you have to be at work. Then you can authentically be yourself in everything that you do. But use the resources that you get from your job to build yourself to get there. Yeah. Full agreement. agreement. I have something to add. So for the outfit thing, not really a concern virtually. I think it's more your setup. Can I hear you? Can I see you? Mm. Do you have distractions going on? I think that's the turnoff. Like, are you just slouching and you know, you're on the computer? Like, what do you look like on the camera? I don't care about your outfit. Wear a t-shirt, wear a sweatshirt, don't care. (laughs) But like, you yeah. know, if you have like a bunch of people behind you and you're just not paying attention, then that's what you're going to look yeah. like at work. I don't want to be working with you. Corey, was it you recently that said something about like, get off your damn phone? I think it yeah. was, yeah, you posted that. It was like, <laughs> yeah. get off your damn phone. Like, what are you yeah. doing on your phone? Um, yes. And I got a lot of backlash for that on that. And I remember. <laughs> Dude, that one didn't hit me viscerally. I was like, yes, thank you, please. For the yeah. love of God, get and, off your yeah, damn people phone. Just didn't get, yeah, they, they thought I was getting on people of like, uh, of of an accessibility point, right? Like, well, not everyone has, you know, um, just about being fair. And I think that's that's a whole another topic of people are, are always, let's be PC and let's be fair. Screw that. Do what you need to do to get the job. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, when I said, don't take an interview from your phone, I mean, if I'm interviewing someone and I say, okay, uh, let me have you pull up your portfolio and let's talk through some of your, your projects. How are you going to do that on your phone? Yeah, right? And, right. And, and still be on camera at this hour, whatever we're doing, right? And people just completely took that the wrong way, but that's that's LinkedIn. That's how it works. Wow. That's the internet for you. I can't think of anything negative. Yeah, I, <laughs> Everything's negative. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's nuts. But but Crystal, your point though, like I actually it's funny. I work with a dude who's on calls constantly and it looks like this. Like seriously. It looks like this. Darth Vader. <laughs> like you guys can't see. I just turned the lights off and all yeah. you can see is like the light from the phone or right from the camera. Yeah. Uh, the sorry, the the screen. But like it looks like that, right? It's like 
dark black or like there's a you know and i'm like i cannot have a meeting yeah. with you just turn yes. your camera off like <laughs> you know i start glowing so creepy yeah. yeah i used to work with this guy and uh yeah i used to work with this guy and you could only see like the top like from his eyes up right his camera was so hot but you know it's it's funny because it, it tells you a lot i think and, and as ux designers it all depends on the role that you're getting right but a lot of times our job as UX designers, you know, we talk about storytelling, we talk about influence. It's it's not just doing the wireframes, it's presenting the work, it's having conversations with people. And part of me says, like, if I'm getting a job, maybe this is because I'm higher level, I don't know, but your job is to present yourself well, right? So that you can help to influence, because that's part of the job of, of UX design. And yep. when you're trying to do that with the dark room and the lights off and, you know, hood over your head... How are you going to influence a product manager, <laughs> oh stakeholder, dear. executive, CEOs, you know, yeah. and, and that's not everybody, every UX designer's job, obviously. Yeah. But to your point, Crystal, like that kind of stuff, it, when you're in an interview, it shows me that you're prepared to do the work if I gave you the offer. Right? Yeah. That's what you're getting at. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's, that's right. like really great advice. And these cameras, they're not, exp I mean, you could use a camera from your computer, right? Lights mm -hmm. on Amazon. Like I have these little, you can't see them yep. at home, but these little like lights, they cost me 15 bucks. You yeah. know, so of course not everybody has access. I get to to computers and things like that. Everyone has a phone, okay. Everyone's a phone, <laughs> but everybody's got access to something that like kind of helps them to kind of act presentable. And I think your point is really great too, because like if I went into an office for an interview, I wouldn't be slouching, right? I would look presentable. Maybe I'd wear a t-shirt, but I'd comb my hair at the very least. You know, <laughs> I'd put some deodorant on, make sure I brush my teeth that morning. But I'm curious. So you guys on your podcast, your goal is to, you know, help with hiring, give people advice on job hunting and things like that. We've talked mm -hmm. about the acting. We talked about some of this stuff. I'm curious, any other big things you guys see constantly that you think is worth pointing out that you're like, stop doing that. It's driving me crazy. Uh, any other things that you see constantly you wish people would quit doing? The overall length of people's case studies and portfolio is just yeah. way out of control. I mean, it is just it is just bananas with how long folks think that their case studies need to be and how detailed they need to be. Um, I I had uh, I had a consultation last night, as a matter of fact, with someone, and uh, it actually it wasn't too long, but it also wasn't detailed enough. It's like it's like there's a balance. Where it's either too long, right, or it's too short and it's not giving enough, right? It's just, you have to tell the story, right, period. And the story can't be too long. If you can remember that, then I think people will have a better, a better time organizing their case studies. Yeah, seeing, seeing case studies that are so long but tell me nothing at the end of the day, like, we've seen a lot of that. Um, it's just all, all fluff. Um, you a know, checklist. Yeah, checklist. This, 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 yeah, it's this, like, yeah. hey, I saw this on the Google boot camp or whatever. So I'm going to fill in. <laughs> I'm so sick of that one. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to fill shit in for each of these things. Like it's a template. I'm like, that's not how that works. Um, yeah. I also think the over-personalization of UX portfolios, I think websites like Dribbble yeah. have really ruined UX in a way. It's like sensationalized being a UX designer on, on the internet. Yeah. It's like oh, a trendy yeah. thing. It's like, let me make this cool, trendy app. I'm like, your app doesn't do anything. It's just trendy looking and it it's following a yeah. ui trend like this is not designed and and so many people by no fault of their own because this is the act the information they have access to are falling into these traps so yeah. it, it's a conversation we've had with the majority of the people we've talked to and tried to like steer them away from that it's like we don't need another cell phone app that like cell phone camera app that just looks shiny right like yeah. give me something that does something for somebody yeah, yeah we try and, and apply for a job at cisco and you've got a dog walking app in your in your portfolio because that's what your bootcamp walks you through to how to create. It's like, you're going to have a tough time convincing those folks that you can do the job there. Yeah. Where's your data tables? Where's your grids? Where's your data? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Where's the boring work? Yeah. The, the lack of <laughs> enterprise yeah. software in people's portfolios as a case study. Exactly. Like, I want to see tables. I don't want to see camera app. You're not going to design camera apps. Man, I don't get me started on the enterprise stuff. I'm, I've been working at GE now for seven years, going on seven years. And I, I, every chance I get, I try to convince people <laughs> about the, the joys of enterprise software. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely like an overlooked thing. People just run from it. Like it's the plague, you know, everybody wants to work at Fang, all these quote unquote sexy places, but man, I love enterprise. I will, I, I, I tell everybody, any chance I get like how amazing enterprise is and how much I get out of it. But this isn't about me today. That's but where I, the true UX work yes, is. Yeah. And it's a problem solving and it's actually rewarding, like helping to make someone's actual work day 
better. Yeah, you make their you know? job yeah. easier. Yes, and yeah. and they go home and they're not in a miserable mood, and they they yeah. like have a good time seeing their kids and everything else, man. Um, yeah, and there's there's a lot less. I don't want to say a lot less, but there's there's a bit less subjectivity when it comes to enterprise software, right? It it has to work, right? You have to get that person from zero to one or whatever they're doing, and if you've solved that part of it. Then the little polish you put on top of it, it it's it's in it's a little less uh, consequential as opposed to if you're doing like a marketing app or something where you you're, you're building this, this this flashy thing for a mobile app. So you can get your job done. It's a lot more simplistic than I think people really give it credit for. Yeah. To reinforce Corey's point, you know, most of the work that I do uh, is done in Miro. A lot of the UI work is done in Miro. Once we establish our design system, it's like I don't need to go and make a high fidelity design because yeah. The UI team, the developers, they know what's going to happen. Uh, so let me just get the core concept and the flow in Miro. And you guys take it from there. And we save a lot of time. It doesn't have to be this yeah. flashy thing all the time. It doesn't mean we don't have polish, but it doesn't always, you don't have to put right. so much time into that. Yeah. Uh, think about the UX first. I remember the, the first time I saw what I, I guess I would consider the UX being sensationalized. I was watching a... It was a webinar for one of the major boot camps. I won't say their name. It was General Assembly. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh... Wait, that was you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, that was like, who else is it. on this Was that guy? Thanks, man. I'm so confused. Look, like, he's got a soundboard back there. I can't <laughs> see it. And you can see the, the trick is... <laughs> <laughs> you can even get the little thing in there. The yeah. little gremlin in his closet. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, yeah. Just, I poke him and he just plays a trombone. Uh, they showed a video of a guy who was doing... Who created... A, a paper prototype, right? And that's one thing that gets juniors all excited is when they see people playing around with little, little slips of paper. Uh, he assembled a prototype and he let his, I think it was his four-year-old, his little girl, go through the, the actions of testing the app that he was he was prototyping with a piece of paper. And I'm watching the uh, I'm watching the comments on the webinar go through, oh my gosh, she's so cute. Oh, I love it. This is so adorable. Oh, I want to be a UX designer. I'm like, that is it. Adorable, yeah. That is, that is the catch, right? That is, <laughs> that is, that is so the worst cute. set of bullshit I, yeah. I've ever seen. But that's how they get people, right? They let them think that it's it's so much oh, it's it's so much more lovely than it than it really it really can yeah. be. We did a whole episode debunking the day oh, in the yeah, life yeah, videos. Yeah. I was of, just gonna bring that up. Oh, God, I don't know yeah. if it's up or not yeah. yet, but like we we did a whole episode debunking that because we're like, this is trash. <laughs> it's so misleading. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you hear about like the dribblefication of UX design, but I think we've gone past that to the TikTokification of I'm gonna coin that today. TikTokification <laughs> of UX nice. design. Um so so Chris, I'm curious when we talk a little bit about enterprise UX design and you work for the Canadian government office of immigration was correct. Was yeah. correct. So that is the opposite of like a sexy <laughs> bank company, but I imagine there's probably some really complex problems. And it's also, I would imagine, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, very rewarding making that immigration experience easier for people because it's already pretty goddamn stressful. If I had to guess, I'm curious what your thoughts are there. It, yeah, it, that's the thing. It's very complex. It's very rewarding, and it's challenging because there's so many boundaries. So you can't really go crazy. When you say boundaries, do you mean design system standards or like government regulation standards? Boundaries on things that you can do and can't do. Anything, anything. You can't just wake up and be like, okay, let's just redo the website, do this and do that. Oh, no, no. You have to go through this person, that person, another person, and then this we can change. We can only change the text here, even though your finding says this. We cannot change that because of the act or there's so many little things. You can't just be, I don't know if everyone knows Kareem Rashid, but, you know, you can't just be this fly designer, you know? He's a product designer. He has nothing to do with UX. But Crystal is very is very plugged in, yeah, to the industry. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if if you Google that, you'll be like, yeah, I've seen his designs everywhere. Um, but basically, you can't just do your own rules. You have to play by the book. But sometimes you can slip in a few things here and there. It's just very it's very complex. But it's rewarding because I'm gonna bring it back to the point of. Antonio, let's say someone comes and applies, I don't know, for the UX team here, which uh, like UX design team at the government, and they're bringing us this portfolio that's, you know, all colorful and all these pretend scenarios and cases. That doesn't mean anything to us. 
because we're working on real things. Like if someone wants to apply for a Canadian passport, like how can I relate to your thing that you're just trying to fix something to make it cute because it's cute and it's fun. Like we don't do cute, fun things <laughs> you know, yeah. we're trying. <laughs> it's so adorable. We're, yeah, it's <laughs> not. That's not what it is. It's like, hey, we're trying to make you know refugees' lives better. People that are trying to immigrate here, trying to be happy and confident when they apply for something or when they go through the website, and not be frustrated because they can't find information or it's too complicated or there's too much text. That's a real problem. So it's important for a candidate or whoever to be able to, you know. Tell someone or the hiring manager, I get it. I know there's real problems out there. It's not just all cute and fun things. Because I don't know, I don't know anyone that does cute and fun things, <laughs> even in the private yeah, sector. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't either. Yeah. yeah. This, despite, I mean, even before I was a quote unquote UX designer, I, I worked a couple of months in the games industry for as a UI artist, and people think that working in games would be still fun. I mean, it's it's complicated. It was, the work was really interesting. I'll give it that, but I wouldn't classify it as fun. It was really difficult and working in that environment was really stressful. Time crunches yeah. on that, especially, I feel like. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I think the fun is the reward for me. That's the fun. The yeah. fun is yeah. me being yeah. able to solve this problem and then seeing that people are happy about it. That's the fun. Yeah. So tying this back to the original, uh, the topic we talked about with the acting, right? You know, when it it got me viscerally, and 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 the more I thought about it, right, that what you're talking about, Crystal, is passion, right? Like you're passionate about that field. And when UX designers, often junior designers, they'll just apply to a thousand jobs, right? And they'll get a random response: "Oh, someone finally accepted me." And they'll go in there with no insight into what the company does. They just found the thing. They clicked quick apply. They didn't even look up the company. They don't know what the company does. They don't know how they how they work. They don't know what they'd be working on. And yep. that's when you have to act, when you just go in there and you're, you're not yourself. But if you figure out what you want to do and you figure out what you're passionate about and you apply to those places, there's no need to act, you know, because you're authentically excited. You're authentically interested in that thing. And assuming you yes. can do the work, right? Um, you yeah. don't have to act. You know what I mean? And so- that's kind of where I think one of the other things too is like when I approach job hunting, I tell people like, find your why, find what you're passionate about. And then you don't have to get into this scenario like Corey's talking about where you have to pretend to be something you're not because you really are passionate about that thing, right? Does that make sense? I'm curious what you guys think. I'll, I'll give you that one. Yeah, I'll give you that <laughs> He's like, one. Yeah, I'll eat that I, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll give you gotcha. that one. <laughs> yeah, but, but again, only on the, on the preface that you can do the work. That's right? true. That you you got to do the work. That yeah. you're first enough. Now, if you're acting and pretending you can do the work, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> that yeah. is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No fake until you make it here. No, absolutely not. Kind of in line with what you're saying is, you know, I... When I, I've, I've thought a lot about this because I'd made a career transition into UX and I, at the end of the day, I'm not passionate about like moving rectangles around on a screen. I'm not passionate about using Figma. I'm not passionate about UX. What I am passionate about though is being a part of developing new technologies. What I am passionate about is helping people um, and also helping people integrate technology into their life in a way that's not intrusive, Right. So those things, it's like, I could work for any industry, any company, as long as those things are met, right? And so it's also, I think about like, where are your passions? Where do they lie? And okay, then how can I meet those, meet those needs? Because there may be another UX designer who's like, I'm just super passionate about UX, like the actual movement of UX design. I'm really passionate about the double diamond. Yeah. I just like, oh, oh, double diamond all day. Exactly. <laughs> well, you, know, you know, what's interesting though is is in that case though, with that passion, you could have any job. Exactly. And still be happy. Exactly. It opens you up. So like it doesn't even, yeah, it doesn't even have to be a UX designer. It could be almost anything, you know? And similar, like for me, when I talk about enterprise software, it's about helping people do their job easier, right? Like I could be a product designer, UX designer. I could be an architect. I could be a product manager. I probably couldn't be an engineer because I don't know how to do any of that stuff. But you know, that, opens me up or anybody who has that passion for that thing to do anything. And then you're not limited to just UX design roles. Yes. You know, assuming you can do the product management work, obviously, which is, you know, we like to think we could do their job, I guess, a lot of it. Yeah. I don't want to deal with those budgets and the spreadsheets and the, all those, uh, all that other stuff they have to deal with. 
But yeah, that I love that. Yeah. And you can also find a job that meets a lifestyle. I think it's super yeah. important. Oh, that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's about a lifestyle fit too, I think. Like too much too many of us try to try to like get a job, especially in America. Um, it, it's a problem. Uh like being like your job becomes your lifestyle, not the other way around. Like I, I need to find a job that fits the lifestyle I want to have in my life. And that's the thing. It's I think a lot of junior designers, they just are so desperate for a UX role that they will apply to literally anything. Yeah. And yeah. not think about these things. And that might be like the biggest piece of advice to come out of like any kind of, well, any kind of thing, not just today, but anything. Um, you know, find that passion. And and that might even answer like, is UX design right for me in the first place? Because right now is is arguably a very very bad time to be looking for a job. Oh my gosh. In it's UX. So, so bad. This may be a hot take, but I'm of the opinion that there is no such thing as an entry level UX job. There, there's so much involved in UX. Um, if this is your first job, um, it's really hard to adapt. It's really hard to learn. There's so many dynamics that happen in a UX job, especially in like a software development company where you have to learn all different aspects of business in terms of business, yeah. strategy. Um, how do I communicate with different types of people? If you've never had a job before and you've never had like a true edge level job before, you're not building core skills like simple things. How do I write an effective email? Um, like mm -hmm. little things. Yeah. It's really, really hard to get ramped up on UX and get ramped up on just existing in a workplace for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I always am yeah. like, find something adjacent. If you can't find that first, first UX job, I'm always saying, find something adjacent and work your way to it. But you got to learn those core skills first because you're going to make yourself look bad unintentionally. It's a lot to juggle. Yeah, that's really interesting that you say that because I, I think part of the problem, what, what, well, part of our problem right now where there is no junior design roles open and now they all want two to three years of experience yeah. is specifically because you can't do the job with zero years of experience, right? Like you're saying, it's very, very hard to do that. And so it requires the company to invest in that, in that person, yeah. to take them under their wing and not only give them work to do, but to teach them how to do it, you know? And <laughs> most companies are unwilling to put the time yeah. and effort in. They just want to hire somebody and call it an entry-level job because they can pay them less, but still expect them to have three to five years of experience. And I think, you know, a couple of weeks back, I did a, a episode on, on the UX education and, and all this. And one of the things that I, I see all the time is this, I, I kind of compare our job to other things like architect or lawyers or doctors, these really specialized skills. And they all have apprenticeship requirements that you have to do before you can ever become, you know, an architect, for instance. Yeah. Right. Nurse, uh, doctor, same way. You have to become a resident for X amount of time before you can actually go and do this work on your own. You have to be shadowed by an actual person doing the work. But for UX design, we don't have any of that. And, you know, right. it's, it makes it, I think, much harder for those junior people to get a job. It really, it kind of, it's like detrimental yeah. to, to that yeah. junior talent pipeline, yeah. you know? So anyway, I don't, I don't know if you guys yeah. have anything to add to that, but that's just something I, I see all the time. No, it's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm recalling in my in, entire career, I don't think we've ever had a, uh, for any job I've ever worked at, that they've had a, a cycle where it's said, okay, we want to bring in some junior designers, right? Meaning that they have no experience whatsoever, right? I don't think I've ever, ever seen that. Um, they've said we're, we're we can bring in some less experienced designers, right? We can bring in some, uh, you know, maybe some folks who are at two years or so. But I've never seen a cycle where that comes in and said, let's bring in some folks who have never Zero had a time. job. Who have yeah. never, yeah, they've never done anything. Yeah. Like, and assume that we're going to teach them. Even those folks who just have a few years of experience, uh, a lot of folks who are applying right now and they, they're looking for something entry level or junior level, and they, and they assume that when they get in, that they're going to be taught, right? You're not going to be taught pretty much anything, right? Then they're, they're not going to teach you. Right? You're, you're going to have to learn and figure it out on your own. They want you there for probably some low level production work, right? If they see you, that you can do that, they look at your portfolio and see that you can do the work, then that's probably enough for them to bring you in. But for what Antonio was saying, like, can you, can you write a coherent email, right? Can you speak coherently to your colleagues? You're going to have to learn and figure all of that out while you're there. No one is going to teach you how to do that, right? They're going to probably teach you how to use their scheduling software, you know, whatever internal tools that they need. But everyone does that, right? It doesn't matter what level you are. Yeah. But they're not going to teach you to be a UX designer, right? They assume that you can do that before they bring you in. It doesn't matter what level you are. And I, I think that the over, I guess the, the, how this whole thing has been sensationalized, right? UX, I feel like it also contributes to this 
very strict bucketing of roles. And now the companies have adopted them for their job postings, junior designer, mid-level designer, senior designer, principal designer, all these things. It's like hey, every company has their own definition of what that means. Um, so how do you achieve that? And to your point, Jeremy, there isn't like principal doctor <laughs> or, or like junior, yeah. junior lawyer. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah, I got, I got a parking ticket. I need my junior lawyer. Like, no, it, it doesn't work that way. So UX design should not be treated in the same way. It's like the boot camp industry and social media. Like it, it just sensationalizes this role and it creates all of these things that now we have to navigate uh, and kind of figure out what's worth paying attention to and what's worth discarding. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned the, they don't, they, they don't have the same, they have all these titles, but they don't know what it means. But the ironic thing is they all copied and pasted each other's job descriptions and stuck that in oh, the yeah. rec. And now yeah. when you get the job, it's like, yeah. but this isn't anything that's said in the rec. So yeah, they, they're not even, right. they don't even know how to hire for, for UX designers, which is unfortunate. I think this subject is really important. I don't know if it's because I come from, you know, pure education, but my background is from industrial design. It's technically creating anything a human interacts with, sometimes interfaces, a chair, whatever. That discipline is pretty solid, I'd say. Like, if you want to use the same terms, it's used everywhere, you know. Uh, if you want to use, uh, I don't know, some methodologies, they're pretty much all the same. But I feel like UX is all over the place and it pisses me off. Like, no <laughs> one has said, okay, this is, you know, this is the dictionary of UX. This is what it is. That's what it is. That's why it's like that. And pretty much that. It's just maybe because it's not solidified in education yet. But for me, it's all over the place. For real. Like everyone has their own definitions. Everyone creates their own methodologies. But at the end of the day, these research methodologies have been created. You just slapped a title on it. So I don't know. Something needs to happen where... This, these are the set rules. These are the principles. It comes from this school. I don't know. <laughs> it's legit. Just use it. I, I can't rely to anything legit. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I, you know, the thing I, I keep going back to comparing it to things like lawyers, doctors, you know, uh, architects is they all have governing bodies. <laughs> Yeah. They all have gatekeepers, you know, yeah. and everyone talks about gatekeepers in UX and there are literally no gatekeepers in UX. Like you can throw that, that insult all around all you want, but no one is keeping you out. No one is telling you, you have to learn this or you're not getting a license. You know, that there are no boards, there's no licensing agents, no yeah. exams, there are no gatekeepers. Isn't and you know, it? you guys, are, you're probably familiar with someone like Darren Hood who says this all the time, like stop making gatekeepers out to be bad. <laughs> like they're there for quality <laughs> control. Yeah. They're there to yeah. make sure. Schools teach the right thing. They're there to make sure you learn the right thing. They're there to make sure you're doing the right thing when you're practicing, you know, and gatekeepers are not necessarily bad, but we use this insult constantly. Everyone's a yeah. gatekeeper. You know, Darren's constantly being accused of being a gatekeeper. He's like, he's not stopping anybody. <laughs> it's such a silly argument, but anyway, yeah. people still do it. I don't know. But also it's like, you know, these free courses online, like, oh yeah, I did that so I can apply. Like, hell no, you didn't do anything. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I went yeah. for one year internship yeah. before I got my bachelor's. That was a requirement. I had to write a huge report, what I did, what I achieved at that company, my challenges, what I messed up and how I can make it better. But this is how you learn in the real world. You're not going to learn from an online course would be like, oh, copy paste. If you're probably copying someone's work, I have no idea, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, how are you thinking? How are yeah. you applying this in real world? I just think it's just all over the place and it's starting to piss me uh, off. Sound like Corey. And, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. pissed Wednesday, that's why. It is Wednesday, there you go. <laughs> the boot camps don't offer insight into user problems and how users actually react when they are pissed off about a problem, right? Like. I came from, I worked in, as a support technician and a QA specialist for five years in a startup. And that gave me very intimate knowledge of how pissed off mm. users get when yeah. their shit doesn't work. And I was like, I want to stop this from happening before right. it gets to yeah. me. What's, who does <laughs> that? What, who is responsible for that? What role is that? It's got to be something. Boom, UX. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. I love that. But it's like, I feel like I would be not a great designer if I did, hadn't had that, those experiences and really understood and empathize, wow, this user is pissed off because of this. I get it. There's not enough of that training. It's like literally like, here's how you use Figma. Here's the design nothing. thinking process. <laughs> Plug it in. It's going to work. I'm like, no. I had um, I had somebody from a, a boot camp not long ago. I got invited to do a portfolio review. 
And speaking of it, like exactly what you're talking about, you know, they, they, their assignment is to create a case study. So they're given a prompt and this prompt was essentially, you know, get people to use the app more. That was the prompt. And the person did their research and was like, you talked to, you know, probably not enough people, but still talking to five people, they all kind of said the same thing. I don't want to use the app more. I want to use it less. I want it to solve my problems and, and leave. I don't want mm-hmm. to be here longer. And they took it back to the instructor and the instructor said, I, that's not the prompt. The prompt is to design some features. So just go design some features and just do what, what the prompt says, you know? Uh, yeah. And <laughs> that I'm like, what the fuck? That, that is insane to me. That would have been a perfect learning opportunity to show how companies are often feature factories and you can think critically and come back with some different ideas on how to improve the overall value, you know, but it shot down completely and it, yeah. they completely missed it, you know? And, and just mm-hmm. to your point, they're not learning real world stuff. They're not learning about solving actual problems. It's just feature factory crap. Go build more stuff. It's nuts. Yep. That's dark design. It yeah. is, man. Yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely deceptive. And that's one of those things that like, when, when, um, I see that and I see, I see this is what happened, not every boot camp Cause I know some people who are doing good work, but when I see that at boot camps, the big ones, especially, it just drives me crazy. Cause these are the people that are making the most money. They're cranking out the most people. And I've talked to other folks that have even said they've stopped accepting applicants from boot camps because of that exact reason, which is, you know, unless there's yeah. th- that person really yeah. stands out, you know, but generally speaking, someone comes in from a boot camp and it's just a kind of mediocre thing. Like, man, pass. Which is sad, you yeah. know, and, and I, I feel so bad for a lot of these people who have spent five figures, $15,000 sometimes. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's not their fault. They're being misled. I agree. That's yeah. exactly the problem. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, we have talked about it quite a bit today. Um, I could talk to you guys for hours about this stuff, um, but we got to wrap it up at some point. I got some questions I want to ask you guys. Before we do that, can you guys plug, I want you guys to plug your podcast. If, tell us where we can find you, uh, where we can listen, subscribe and all that stuff. Yeah, if you just do a a search for a UX plus one, that is the uh, plus symbol. (laughs) And uh, on Apple or, uh, yeah, on Apple or uh, Spotify, you will find us out there on all your your typical streaming platforms. And uh, we'd love to have you as listeners, and we appreciate it. You can also go to uxdesignjob.com forward slash podcast if you want to catch up on older episodes or possibly end up being on the show. Right on. And uh, you guys, I know, Corey, you post quite a bit on LinkedIn. Antonio, Crystal, you guys, do you all do any LinkedIn posting? I don't think we're connected on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll fix that after this. But... I mostly network in the DMs. <laughs> okay. Networks in the DMs, maybe. All right. I, I was writing blog posts for Medium a little, a while ago. I'm trying to get back into that. So that's all right. that's right my thing. I'll post on LinkedIn every every now and then. We got to work on everybody's personal branding. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll, I'll link to everybody in uh, in the show notes. So check out the show notes at beyondyourxdesign.com for some links to all this stuff too. All right, guys. So I got a few questions I like to ask my guests to help all the listeners get to know everybody a little bit better. I've got five questions and we got three of y'all. So I don't know how you want to do this. You can answer all of them or you can answer some of them if you want, if you feel really strong about that. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Crystal, I want to make sure we get you out of here in time for your uh, your next meeting. So let's kick it off. What is your favorite non-design book? For the longest time, mine was a book called Mastery by Mr. Robert Greene. Um, it, it really talked about the fact how we kind of worship people who seem like they have this amazing talent, right? And we, we tend to misconstrue talent with practice, right? And if you want to get good at anything, then you practice and you spend an inordinate amount of time on it. And before you know, you will have these quote unquote godlike abilities, but it just comes with putting time and effort into it. And anyone, you know, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be someone special to be good at whatever it is you're, you're chasing. You just have to put time into it. Crystal, what about you? So I don't really have a favorite book because I read too much and these two make fun of me. <laughs> and most of the books are design books, not UX, product design. <laughs> um, but I am currently reading a really good book. I don't know if any of you have read it, either you're listening or any of you guys on the podcast right now. It's called Switch, uh, How to Ch- uh, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. It's by Chip and Dan Hees. Basically, it gives you just very, very well-written insights on, you know, how to make any changes in your lifestyle, at a company you're working with, and basically how your brain blocks you to like making any of those changes. And it's been really good so far. Well, uh, I'm going to add it to my list. Do it's really good. Right on. Uh, what about you, Antonio? Uh, I'm looking at mine right now. I, I would say mine's actually a series. It's a trilogy. It's the, I'm a huge sci-fi fantasy nerd. So 
Mine's going to be uh, the Admiral Thrawn series, the Star Wars Admiral Thrawn series by Timothy Zahn. I okay. think it's awesome. Worth the read if you like that kind of stuff. Um, I think Disney dropped the ball by not turning those into the movies. But oh, man. That's yeah. a conversation topic for later. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I was talking to somebody the other day. Actually, guess I had Dr. Leitner. He's a big Star Wars nerd, too. And and he we asked him about uh, Star Wars. And I've always said, if you had to pick between Star Wars and Star Trek, I'm always going to pick Star Trek. And the reason I love Star Trek is all- I love Star Trek. Me too. Yeah, it, but the thing I love about it is all the episodes like, builds the characters and the stories, and you get to know them personally more than like an hour, two hour long movie like you, you generally did in Star Wars. But the cool thing about all the books is you can kind of like dive into those, the character building in all these books, you know? Um, yeah. The problem is you just have to read them all. That's the problem. You've got to read them all. <laughs> <That's> all <laughs> read. I, I love both. I have Star Trek books in front of me too. I, I love them both and they serve different purposes, you know? Yeah, right on. I love it. Yeah, my kids and my, my wife and kids, they always get me like a Star Trek book for a uh, birthday or Christmas or something. So I've got like a whole bunch nice. of these books that I haven't read them all. So don't tell my kids yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Uh, you won't tell. All right, good. You guys, it's secret safe, but just the, between the three of us, no one else will hear this. All right. Uh, what is your favorite right. non-design podcast? So I admittedly don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I have recently picked up an old hobby of making music. And so I've been watching a lot of stuff on YouTube on, on bee making oh, nice. and, um, and uh, using, using various types of expensive gear that I spent too much money on. <laughs> Do you have kids though? So I don't, you can afford I don't. it. So yeah, so, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I, I can afford it. I mean, it it's not an excuse. I really probably still shouldn't have bought it all, but you know, I, I got it. So I got to figure it out. <laughs> got to use it now. Whatever makes yeah, you happy. You put it out there. Now, yeah. now everybody knows. Now, now we got to, we're going to check back <laughs> in six months, see how it's going. All right. Yeah. Crystal, what about you? What's your favorite non-design podcast? I'm sorry. I do not listen to podcasts, even <laughs> though I am online and I'm currently recording one. It's yeah. very rare that I'll listen to one. If I do, it's probably like a biography or some sort of person. Okay. Do you do eBooks though? Or, sorry, audiobooks? No, I, ha- do do no, no oh. I have to touch the paper. Oh, I'm you're really old school. Well, this is, you're, you're, a, you're an industrial designer. I mean, it makes sense, yeah, right? Yeah, I cannot no, okay. read yeah. on the screen. Right. So you want to pass. We're going to pass this. <laughs> yeah, pass this you. one for me. All right, we'll pass. And Tony, you got one? I love podcasts. Um, my fa- pandemic got me back into gaming. I was really into gaming like pre-college, and now it got me back into it because what else was I going to do when, when I was at home sure, all day? Yeah. So. I started listening to gaming podcasts and the one I'm really into is called Goddamn GameCube. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> the guys like do lots of retros of really old game series and new game series. And oh, they nice. go really deep into the lore and to like the dev teams behind it and the design behind it. And they talk about different game design elements. So there's like a design perspective there as well. So that's the one I listen to a lot. Right, right I, I think it's fascinating. Hell yeah, man. I love it. If, nice. if you're into Star Trek, there's a podcast you should listen to called The Greatest Generation. Ooh. And it's two dudes okay. that have, they every episode they review a Star Trek episode, but they do it in order. And they started with The Next Generation, episode one, Farpoint Station, and they have gone all the way through. They're in like Voyager now. <laughs> so oh they have done gosh. like all, I think what, 10 Damn. or eight, eight or nine episodes, uh, seasons of like the original TNG. Then they did... Uh, they went into Deep Space Nine, and then they went, or they went into Voyager, then Deep Space Nine, whichever one was. I think Voyager was last. Yeah, Deep Space Nine, then Voyager. So, Deep Space Nine, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, if you're into that, check it out. Oh, I'm saving uh, that right now. <laughs> right on. Crystal, you have no interest. You're not, not going to want it. So uh, don't worry about it. Crystal's like, this damn nerd. <laughs> Crystal, I'm going to start you off with this one. I think this is probably one you hopefully haven't answered. What's your favorite meal? And this could be sushi something. Sushi and ramen. Sushi, you don't even have to. Wait, all right. There you go. Sushi and ramen. All right. You got a favorite spot? Yes, in Canada though. That's all right. <laughs> Ottawa. I got Ottawa. It's yeah. called Unique. I got I got Canadian listeners. We got a couple. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Check it out. All right, Corey, what about you? Favorite meal? That would be Vietnamese pho. Oh man, dude. So wait, you're yeah. you're where are you now? You're in. I'm in Tulsa. Oh, uh, okay. Do you get there, there's, a, there's a nice spot, but I can actually make pho from scratch. Really? Oh, how'd you learn that, man? Uh, YouTube. Right on. Okay. Uh, man, a, lot of, a lot of trial and error. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Corey loves YouTube. A lot of people don't realize this. Corey, you, you probably know this, but down in New Orleans, there's a huge Vietnamese uh, community. And they have yeah. some of the best Vietnamese food I've ever had down there. It's like the maybe the one thing I miss about New Orleans <laughs> is right. all the Vietnamese yeah. food. But yeah, we got this like little Vietnam down there. It's really cool. It's awesome. All right. Antonio, what about you, man? This is a loaded question. But if I'm going like death row meal, 
It's uh, wings and pizza. Wings and pizza. Nice. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah no. How do you feel when you go to a pizza place and they bake their wings in the pizza oven? Pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta deep fry that shit uh, I'm the same way man you know what every time I get pizza and I go get wings I ask them like you guys bake the wings or do you fry them if they say baked I'm like no nope, I don't need them no thanks yeah. alright good yeah, good yeah. answer make that extra crispy baked wings yeah oh the baked wings are awful yeah they put them through the pizza oven it's so bad it's not good I'm only like four hours from Buffalo so we got really good Buffalo wings here. So. Oh yeah, dude, that's right. right Love on, it. Oh, you're, yeah, you said uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh. Yep. Pittsburgh. Okay, I thought it was yep. I said, almost said Philadelphia. All right, uh, what's your favorite vacation spot, Crystal? I'm gonna start with you since you you passed last time. This is very very hard. I don't have a favorite spot, but I will say my favorite area would be the Mediterranean. I'll put okay. it that way: sun, sea, ocean, beach, anything. That includes that and the Mediterranean. I'm good with good food, obviously. Yeah, like the opposite of <laughs> Ottawa, basically. That's exactly <laughs> the opposite of Texas. <laughs> well, yeah. Texas is hot and they have the sun. <laughs> and it's and yeah. the ocean. Yeah. So you yeah. guys should stop saying that. That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, Galveston though, the yeah, beaches there aren't aren't all that great. But uh, I, I agree with Crystal on this one. Um, I don't really have a favorite spot, but I a lot of my family lives in Italy, so. I will say Italy slash Mediterranean, Um, but really anywhere new. I love to travel and discover new places. So you're you're very Italian, uh, your name, very Italian. So I assume you're Palatiano. Um, uh, un po', un po', yeah. Non molto, non no bene. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I took I took four semesters of Italian uh, in college, and all I can say is "Io parlo un po' italiano, ma non molto, non molto bene." That's all. That's all I can say. You ask me to say anything else, I can't. Sorry, but my my teacher said yeah. I have a very good accent. If I just you know, if I would just apply myself. But anyway, Corey, what about you, man? Favorite vacation spot? Yeah, I fall into that category of not having traveled enough to say I have a Texas? favorite spot. Um, uh, I've been to Texas. I actually lived in Texas for five years. I have no plans to ever go back to Texas. I mean, I probably shouldn't say Manor because that, that's, I end up there next year. Who knows? You're really close. Um, You're getting closer to Texas, man. I, I am really close, oh, yeah. Mind. I should probably shouldn't say that. You're like Texas's hat, right? Oklahoma's I, I spent, like Texas's hat. It is. It's exactly it. Um, I spent a couple of months in, in Istanbul Ooh. in 2021 during wow. the pandemic. Wow, oh, during the pandemic. It was, uh, it was nice, but it's also not where I'd say I want to go back to really? anytime soon. Um, not that it was not that there was anything bad about it. It's just like getting into Istanbul was was fine, uh, breeze, no problems. Getting out of the country was a huge headache. Oh huge wow, because of COVID. So, and stuff? Um, but yeah, that's another whole other story. Oh man, that's crazy. No, no, no there's a lot of corruption and oh, that kind of stuff. Oh wow, but, yeah, okay, I can see uh, that. Oh, man, yeah. I always wanted to go to Istanbul. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, go on a on a travel on a little three month uh, travel visa and get out. Right, <laughs> don't try and stay any longer like I did. <laughs> oh, you stay, you overstayed your visa. Uh, that was, <laughs> is that what happened? I mean, I did. I yeah, no, no. I don't well, want to get yes, in trouble, but not on okay. purpose. I mean, I went through the steps to try and get a longer stay, and then all kinds of uh, bullshit happened. Yeah, you got to <laughs> follow the money, yeah. man. You got to you got to pay him. Yes, yeah, uh, exactly. Well, that's a yeah, yeah, didn't pay enough. But I've I've got some aspirations to spend some time in Asia when I get the chance. Uh, Singapore is really high on my list as well as Malaysia and a little further coming back west a little bit to uh, like Greece and such. Mm, Mediterranean. Like Singapore. Now that's also very expensive. Yeah. yeah that, <laughs> I was talking to somebody who went there for work. We have, we have a thing, uh, a shop there for work and they stayed there for like a week and it was like $20,000. <laughs> they they cool went there forward. during mm. uh, some football event. There was a soccer event or something going on that week. And the prices for the hotels were like a thousand a night. Or anyway, yeah. it was like insane. But G paid for it. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, all right. What yeah. is your favorite design tool that's not Figma? We already talked about Miro, so that's probably gonna be on there. But uh, who wants to kick that off? I think this crew probably isn't really all into Figma, but there's a lot of people out there I talk to that's that's like their bread and butter. <laughs> I love ahead, Figma. Antonio. I wouldn't say it's my favorite design tool because I love it for prototyping. I love to prototype stuff. But it, it's got to be Miro. Miro is for me like the one stop shop for everything. I, I just wish they had a prototyping tool. Yeah, yeah. There's no way to really like link stuff together. They do have like they yeah. they just released like the wireframe kit. You can like drag and drop all the little buttons and components and things. I use that but, all the time. Yeah, there's yeah. no way to like link them together though. Yeah, that's true. You can't link them together. They, really they cool. have this new AI feature they just dropped too, where you can do like mind maps and it'll give you suggestions, oh, wow. which oh, is that's really cool. cool. I haven't tried. I, that. I did that the other day to kind of like. 
unclog some some like writer's block, design block. Uh, it helped. I'm like, this is this is a cool feature. Uh, so yeah, that's probably my favorite. Yeah, I had, the little thing popped up. I was in Miro yesterday, and the little thing popped up, and it was like, try a new AI tool. I just see that stuff. It's like everywhere. I'm just like close. Everybody's got yeah. something stupid out. I just like ignore it now. But yep. uh, I have to check it out. If it's that cool, I have to check it out. All right, Crystal, what about you? What's your favorite design tool that's not Figma? Uh, definitely Illustrator. I have mm. it has nothing to do with my job, but just my personal gigs. I like mm. to draw on it, do posters, use it for laser cutting, vinyl cutting, anything. It's oh, fun. Nice. Do you have like a tablet pen and all the tablet and all that stuff you can like yeah. sketch? Oh, that's cool. I, I have like all that. the little gadgets. I even have a pen that you can draw and there's like a camera you put on uh, your piece of paper and it captures the ink and it turns it to a vector in the computer. It's wow. all ink pen, I think. Oh, that's fascinating. I've never seen that before. Yeah. That's probably cheaper than buying one of those whack It was. It was like $100. Tablets, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those tablets yeah. are like five or 600 bucks. That's I awesome. Know. I have to demo now for his best time. Yeah. I will. <laughs> yeah, then I'll definitely watch. <laughs> ASMR. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Corey, what about you, man? Favorite design tool that's not Figma. All right. This is, this is the old man talking now, right? So um, I, when I got into design, it was because of Flash right back in the day. <laughs> Oh, um, watch out. I loved animating the Flash. Oh, I made a bunch yeah, of Flash websites. I, I used to do a lot of cool shit. I, I used to be a cool person. <laughs> I really did. Um, but the closest thing to that now would be After Effects. And that is probably one of my favorite design tools along with uh, I've been learning Unreal. Oh, uh, wow. wow. Doing more game stuff? That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah um, After Effects, my computer can't handle it. It just, it dies. <laughs> like, it just, it <laughs> crashes. Yeah. Do you see that 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 goldie spinny thing behind me? Oh, that's, I see that's, that. That's, okay. that's your uh, yeah. you built it. I, I assume you built that. Yeah. Um. My my laptop. I have this really crappy old Dell, and when I do edit the podcast, like just MP3s, you know, saving an MP3 from audition takes like thirty minutes. <laughs> so I think hey. if I ever if I get any more patrons, uh, first thing I'm doing is buying a buying a computer. So if you're out there and you're listening and you need you want nice. to help support the show, uh, <laughs> buy me a computer. It doesn't take me thirty minutes to export an MP3. Please sponsor Jeremy. Yeah, please for the love of God. <laughs> Send me your money. <laughs> All right. Uh, cool, guys. Well, that's it for me for today. I, I don't have anything else. Anything before we get out of here, just burning things you want to tell these junior job hunters, junior designer job hunters to just tips, tricks, one last closing thought before we get out of here. You're not alone. Use your network and you will get there. Yeah, you're right, baby. And look for those design adjacent jobs because it's tough out there. I get it. Don't take something random because you feel like you have to to make ends meet. Try to at least take something that's going to give you some adjacent experience that you can apply and and shift into design work. Don't get I love that advice. Don't get too discouraged. I love it. Yeah, and be curious. Do your research. Don't find a quick solution just to get whatever. Be patient and keep doing your job. Uh, research. Yeah, I and swear it. in your interviews. Person interview. There you go. Oh. <laughs> right. Wear yeah. a bathing suit at your interview. You'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> Depends how hairy you are. I don't know. I think if I were to wear a bathing suit in my yeah. interview, it'd probably scare some people off. But yeah, you know, hey, some people might like it. I don't know. Who knows? I ain't judging. All right, guys. So cool. So so check out the UX Plus One podcast. We're going to link to that in the show notes. So make sure you check that out. I'm going to put some links to all these fine people on LinkedIn. You can find them, connect with them, interact with them. Follow Corey every Wednesday when he's pissed. Uh, they're always worth, <laughs> they're always worth reading. <laughs> Thanks again, guys. This was, this was fantastic. The great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care. Well, all right, y'all. That's it for us for today. I hope we helped to shed a little bit of light on how and when to use your authentic self during the job hunting process. And I'm curious, how has authenticity helped you during your job hunt? Or maybe it's hurt you. Have you ever gotten feedback that <laughs> this was the reason that you didn't get the job offer because you were too authentic? I would actually love to hear that story if that happened. Let me know what you think on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at hello at beyonduxdesign.com. I would love to hear from you. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would love it if you left a five-star review. That would help me out so much more than you know. And if you know anybody who might find any of this stuff useful, why don't you tell them about it? That would be fantastic. If you want to help keep the show independent and ad-free, check out all those Patreon sponsorship packages at beyonduxdesign.com slash support. You can join Chris, Siraquan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin by supporting the show for as little as $3 a month. And there's some awesome perks like that badass holographic Beyond UX Design sticker. You can get a shout out on the show every week. There's even a package to meet with me for 30 minutes every month. 
And don't forget to head on over to beyondnewxdesign.com slash audible trial to download Louder Than Words by Todd Henry. Sign up for a free 30-day audible trial. Cancel at any time. And the book is yours to keep forever. And in case you forgot, I've partnered with audible.com. So anytime you sign up for a free trial, you'll help support the show. There's no obligation and you can cancel anytime and the audiobook is yours to keep forever. So get a free audiobook on me and help support the show. Remember to sign up for the newsletter and check out all the past episodes along with all the show notes at beyonduxdesign.com. I hope you keep coming back for more great UX tips from Beyond UX Design. And until next time, remember you're more than a designer because there's more to UX and design. I'll see you around. Take care, y'all. I got all flabbergasted with so many faces to look at. I got, got all sidetracked. I realized that I did not have you introduce yourselves in the very beginning. So what I'm going to do is have you introduce yourself. I'll cut it in. I'll put it in the beginning. And then we'll go uh, straight into, after that, we'll go into the Q&A. Sounds good. You guys cool with that?